Video games can provide us many different things. Great gameplay, iconic characters, interesting worlds, and of course, brilliant stories that we can lose ourselves in. Beautiful storylines is why Ash and I certainly love specific video games like Mass Effect, Dragon Age, Bioshock, and Halo, just to name a few. And like most fictional pieces, video games enlist several writing tools to construct a narrative, and in this video, I want to look at one of these tools. Hi, this is Rima from Odyssey Gaming, and today I'll be looking at the use of foreshadowing in video games, and because this video would be too long to edit if I looked at every example in every game that we love, I'm going to focus on what we do best here, the Bioware games. So join me as I look at some great examples of foreshadowing in Dragon Age and Mass Effect. Before we start looking at specific examples, we should look at what foreshadowing actually is in relation to storytelling. Defined by Merriam-Webster as, quote, an indication of what is to come, it is a common trope used in media to either give the audience a hint of where the story is going or help prepare the audience for something to come, either because it'll be shocking or it's a twist, and of course to build tension in the story. There are several ways of using foreshadowing in media, and it depends on what media you're using, for example, novels, video games, movies, plays, etc. For example, dialogue between characters could hint at something coming up in the future, or using the setting or environment, for example, the weather or specific props, or using repetitive events or patterns emerging in the plot may indicate something may be coming. And sometimes people use music to create a mood or a sense of deja vu. As I've already said, there are a lot of examples of foreshadowing in media, and the examples I want to discuss are just some of my favourite in our favourite two series, Dragon Age and Mass Effect, and hopefully they act as examples of varied types of foreshadowing that you can find. Mass Effect definitely has some very good use of environmental and visual foreshadowing that you can easily miss. I know I certainly did. So what are these examples? Well, one of the most prominent examples is probably one most players actually identified, and that is the use of eyes and indoctrination. One of Saren's most prominent features are those robotic blue eyes that we know now is a sign of Reaper augmentation and indoctrination. The Lucid Man also has striking blue robotic eyes, and though it's made clear that he is a big fan of augmentation, the level of his indoctrination becomes clear by Mass Effect 3. There is also the fact that the Lucid Man and Saren share a very complicated past that is showcased in the Mass Effect Evolution comic that also involves Reaper tech. And speaking of Saren, he lacks any visual markings on his face that are commonly seen on most Turians. And in fact, the codex entry on Turian state, quote, the lack of facial markings is looked down upon in Turian society. The Turian term bareface refers to one who's beguiling or not to be trusted. And this definition hits the nail on the head for Saren. And the only other bareface Turian that we kind of encounter in the trilogy is Warden Corel who you encounter when you're trying to retrieve Subject Zero from Purgatory. And he also ends up betraying you. And this last example is a pretty small one and maybe has more to do with dialogue, but when entering the council chambers with Ashley and Toe at the start of Mass Effect 1, she comments on how defensible the staircase would be in a case of an attack. And this is pretty cool because this is actually the site of the final fight with Saren at the end of Mass Effect 1. There are a lot of examples of foreshadowing dialogue that hints at something to come in the story, and in this case most of my favourite examples come from Dragon Age, but let's look at the one I really love from Mass Effect. So during Tally's loyalty mission in Mass Effect 2, you have the opportunity to speak to various admirals who will be deciding on her fate, and one of these admirals is Zal Chorus Vas Quip Quip. Though he may just be a pragmatist, he makes a statement that will be brought to pass in Mass Effect 3 if you choose the Geth over the Corians. They would see our fleet destroyed in the skies over our homeworld rather than find a new colony and adapt. And now to move on to the examples that I really like in Dragon Age. There are quite a few, so I've just picked the handful um, that I didn't automatically pick up in my first playthrough, but once knowing how the game actually ended, it really made me smile about the hints that were left there all along for us to kind of figure out. 
There is a lot of party banter in Dragon Age Inquisition and you may not get through all of it depending on the party combinations that you have out with you. I played a lot with Barak and the Iron Bull and I was treated to this very nice piece of audio. Hey Varric, I was reading your stuff. Where do your bad guys come from? Well, some of them come from Tevinter and some are Ben-Hazareth spies. But I like the stories where the villain was the man beside you the whole time. The best villains don't see themselves as evil. They're fighting for a good cause, willing to get their hands dirty. Varric's description here about his favourite type of villain may be a little familiar to a certain elf. Anders' actions at the end of Dragon Age 2 practically kicked off the Major Rebellion and it was fairly clear that he was spiralling towards some form of destructions with lines like, quote, mix the ingredients together and boom, Justice and I are free, during one of his loyalty missions. But if you play Dragon Age Origins DLC Awakening, you can encounter Anders there. During one part of the DLC, when you encounter a ballista pointed straight towards a religious statue, he states, quote, I'm always up for a bit of iconoclasm. And iconoclasm, for those of you who don't know, is the destruction of monuments and images commonly associated with religion. And what does Anders do at the end of Dragon Age 2? And then there are the two prophecies that we hear from Sandal and Flemeth, respectively. Sandal's strange prophecy seems to indicate the rise of Solus and the breach in the sky. One day the magic will come back. All of it. Everyone will be just like they were. The shadows will part and the skies will open wide. Huh? What's this? When he rises, everyone will see. And Flemet's prophecy seems to tell Hawk their destiny and their fall into the abyss, indicating their fate in Dragon Age Inquisition during the mission into the abyss. Before I go, a word of advice. We stand upon the precipice of change. The world fears the inevitable plummet into the abyss. Watch for that moment, and when it comes, do not hesitate to leap. As I said earlier, using repeating events or patterns can act as a way of preparing your audience for the final arc of your story. The most obvious example of this is the use of the organic synthetic cycle in Mass Effect. Though it's not really hidden or subtle, we see this conflict over and over again with Leviathan and AI, the Geth and the Quarians, the Zatil and the Za in Javik's time, and finally between the Reapers and the Milky Way. And this repeating pattern of events is something that Shepard can finally break. In my opinion though, I don't think it's really foreshadowing for the players, but more like it's foreshadowing for the characters themselves to notice the flaw in their kind of game world. Musical scores can help set the tone and subconsciously make an audience feel different things and subconsciously prepare them for certain events. Take for example the Hawk family theme that plays throughout Dragon Age 2. But most notably it plays when Bethany or Carver are killed at the start of the game, then again when you inform Leandra of the remaining siblings fate in the Deep Roads, and then again when Bodan tells you when Sandal and him are leaving. The best use of this theme is at the start of the All That Remains quest, when you find white lilies in your home and Leandra missing. Because of how it's already been used, you probably already have a sense of dread, which is reinforced when she dies in your arms and this theme plays again. His magic was the only thing keeping her alive. I'm so sorry. I knew you would come. Don't move, Mother. We'll find a way to... Shh. Don't fret, darling. That man would have kept me trapped in here. But now, I'm free. And then there's a familiar piano tune that runs through several scores in Mass Effect 3. At first it plays during Take My Hand, when Shepard first interacts with a child trying to get them out of the vent. Then it plays again during the Leaving Earth soundtrack, although there's a lot more noise surrounding it, including Reaper sounds. And then it finally plays as part of an end once and for all 
which plays when Shepard sacrifices themselves to save the galaxy at the end of Mass Effect 3. This musical thread is so good for so many reasons. For one, it carries the helplessness that Shepard must feel at all three points in the game. Not being able to help the child, not being able to stay on Earth, and not being able to live to see the end. Two, it represents resolve. Having to do things for the greater good whether you like it or not, leaving Earth and sacrificing yourself to save everyone else. And three, the tune is played each time we encounter the child, when we're trying to help him, when we see him die on Earth, and when we see him again in the form of the light child. And what I love most about this is when it starts playing again as part of an end once and for all, it's a lot more peaceful and determined, and it's almost like Shepard has embraced the end. So those are my favourite examples of foreshadowing in Bioware games, and more specifically in Dragon Age and Mass Effect. I really like looking at different tools storytellers might use to portray their epic tales, and in the case of these games, because their stories span such a long series, it's really interesting to see how far ahead the devs may have actually planned. And speaking of foreshadowing, I am also very curious to know how that Lyrium item will factor into Dragon Age 4. It definitely can't be good, right? But I hope you enjoyed this video and thanks for sticking with me because I know it's a little different to what we normally produce. And I would love to know what your favourite forms of foreshadowing in games are, not just in Bioware games. Let me know in the comments below. And as usual, if you like this video, please like and subscribe and please share this video to help the channel grow. Thank you so much for watching guys and I will see you next time.